If you are ready, shout a big hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Father. You can play for me on the keyboard. My inspiration is connected to sound. If I don't hear sound, it's difficult for me to ascend. <laughs> so when I'm sharing, I like sound. If you find my chord, this hall will explode. I'm telling you. <laughs> if you find my chord, because I can come with a note, but the oracles of God are in the mountains of God. And until a man ascends, the tablets of the testimonies cannot open to him. He will come with his Bible school notes. But those cannot bring life. The one the Lord breathes upon are the ones that come from the lively oracles. And many times you need to ascend to high places in the spirit to be able to tap into the fresh vibrations of God. And for me, my own access point, ascendancy agency, is a sound. A sound. If he finds the right chord, <laughs> Jesus will help us in the name of Jesus. Yes, yeah, so in the morning, we began our journey from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. And it says to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I began to establish to us the place of grace. I said there were two reasons, amongst others, why grace is too important in our sojourn on the face of the earth. The first reason is because man was created to function in the realms of deity. He was not created to function as an earthly being. Although he was placed in the earth, but his place and his realm of functionality was in the realm of God. So the Bible said in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. So the dominion that the man exercises on the face of the earth is a function of the level of intercourse that he has with divinity. This is why in Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, the Bible said, In the cool of the day, the voice of God came walking in the garden of Eden. So the man was created to live and to function from the realm of God. As he functions from the realm of God, what he does when he appears on the earth is to bring legislation and government such as is obtainable in Zion. So the man becomes an agent of dominion. But that dominion will be impossible except as he functions in the class of God. This is why the Bible made him in the image of God. And I told you that the image that God created man was not just the image of the father. It was not the image of the son. It was not the image of the spirit. It is the image of the Godhead. So captured in the design of the man was the ability to tabernacle the full Godhead bodily on his inside. So he represents the father, the son, and the spirit at the same time. That was the realm the man was created to function in. But unfortunately, he yielded to the deception of the serpent and he fell from the class of God. Instantly, fellowship was truncated. He was driven from Eden. Instantly, dominion was lost. Instantly, the powers that the man had and the authority he exercised from the realm of God was taken away from him. So he became a man of earth. So what grace comes to do is to restore the man back to the realm of God so that he can function in the dominion mandate and live as a God-man on the face of the earth. So without grace, it's impossible for man to mirror the dimensions of God. No matter how intelligent that man is, his intelligence will be futility when he comes into the league of spirits. That's why many men, a professor can be dwarfed by a witch of 10 years. Because he can be intelligent in the realm of mortals. But when he appears in the league of spirits, he will be dwarfed with his knowledge. No matter how vast his understanding is, he doesn't have a place in the realm of gods. Every spirit will dwarf him. The spirit of fear will dwarf him. The spirit of immorality will dwarf him. The spirit of sickness will dwarf him. The only powers that the man now sustains to function in the realm and in the class of God is captured and predicated upon the ingredient called grace. And that's why I said grace is not just a merited favor. Grace is divinity expressed through humanity. So Peter began to encourage us that in order to make the most out of life, this small life that we have, you know, Apostle was sharing a while ago and he said, this life is short. The life is short because when you compare it to eternity, 
even if you live for 200 years, it's short. Because the existence of this realm, this frame of reference, compared to the cycles of eternity is a dot. The whole existence of human race compared to the cycle of eternity is a dot. So life is too short. So we have to maximize grace. So Peter, having understood the place of grace as touching the fulfillment of purpose, began to counsel his children. And he said to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I began to share with us the three simple infrastructures that makes for growing in grace. And I said the first is to always ask for it. They come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and help in the time of need. I said the reason many people struggle is that they want to get results by their own ability. But the way the realm is designed is such that you cannot function by your own ability. Because if you function by your ability, you will take the glory. So the only way you will succeed in this realm and, and receive the approval of God is when it is done by grace. So he said the way to journey and to grow in grace is to constantly ask for grace. So if there is a challenge confronting you, the first point of reference is not to call your uncle. The first point of reference is not to call your human connection. The first point of reference is to ask for the grace that makes a plane of the mountain that confronts you. If you know how to access grace, you will have no challenge in life. Mountains will become opportunities for you to manifest. Hope you know that everybody you celebrate today is celebrated in the face of obstacles. Without mountain, mountains, we can have no champions. The reason you sing the name of the late Archbishop Benson in Dahosa was because many times he stood before the dead and he told the dead to come back to life. Those are moments of terrible defeat, but grace knows how to make a plane out of mountains. So every challenge that confronts you is an avenue for you to leap to another realm of glory. Challenges were not designed to destroy us. Challenges were designed to give us an opportunity to come to higher pedestals in spiritual engagement. So every challenge you go through today is a kind of grace that you are exposed to to access it. So if your, if your challenge is poverty, then it is time for you to learn the grace that makes wealth. If your challenge is sickness, it's time for you to understand the grace that makes well. If your challenge is, is backwardness, then it's time for you to know the grace that gives speed and advantage to man. If your challenge is that you are locked away from progress and civilization, then it's time for you to access the grace that makes the gate of the city to open. Every challenge is a revelation of a dimension of grace. And the moment you can access that grace, that challenge becomes a platform for your manifestation. The platform for the manifestation of men is not this pulpit. They are the challenges of life. If there are no challenges, there will be no platforms. You can stand on the tallest pulpit, but nobody will honor you. No spirit will regard you. And there will be no posterity tied to your name. It is the challenges you surmount that become platforms upon which the glory of God can be seen through your life. And what makes a challenge a platform is the level of grace you can access. So it says to come boldly to the throne of grace. So men who are champions in life are men who grow in grace. And men who grow in grace are men who know how to appropriate grace. Many believers don't know how to appropriate grace. They struggle with their challenges and they want to surmount them by their own abilities. I told you in the morning that from the studio of eternity, the flesh has already been judged. And the verdict on the flesh is that the flesh profits nothing. This is Jesus speaking. The flesh profits nothing. So it's a waste of time to attempt to achieve what you want to achieve in the flesh. The flesh has already been judged. The only thing that gives you an advantage in this visible realm it is the grace that you have at your disposal. So the first way to grow in grace is to appropriate grace. And we appropriate grace first by asking. Number two, I say we appropriate grace by sustaining the disposition of humility. Because God resists the proud, but he giveth more grace to the humble. So the moment a man sustains the disposition of humility, every grace he's looking for naturally begins to flow in his in direction. But a man who is proud, even if he does what is right, God himself will resist him because he resists the proud. The reason many people don't succeed is not because the devil is fighting them. God is the one stopping them. Because if they succeed, their soul will be mortgaged in the process. Their arrogance, their pride will make them lose even the little relationship they have with God. Have you not seen many men who had a vital and functional relationship with God until fame came, until money came, until power came? So many times when God finds out that the heart of a man is wrong, he keeps him in one location for a long time. So that when he sustains the disposition of humility, God himself will raise him up. This is why David said, by my God, 
I ran through a troop. By my God, I leaped over a wall. I didn't succeed because I was a technocrat in military intelligence. I succeeded because there was an invincible finger that sustained me in the face of adversity. He said many times before he went to battle, he didn't come and say, I have Eliasa, the son of Dodo. He never came to say, I have Adoni, the S knight. These were men that could kill 800 men by spears. The Bible said once upon a time, Eliasa, the son of Dodo, he took a spear and he fought from morning till night and he slew 800 men until his hand became cleaved to the sword. But when David goes to battle, it doesn't depend on Eliasa. He goes back to the, to the ark and or is the direction the Urim and the Tumim gives to him that determines the direction of war. And many times God will tell him, wait until you see the Muberi tree move. For when the Muberi tree move, I have gone ahead of you. So the victory of David was predicated upon the disposition of humility and absolute dependence of God. And it was that what that's what made David invincible. When David was old, we understood that he fought 44 battles and he won them all. Success by grace. The true kind of success. The success that brings rest and fulfillment. But it takes humility. Most of us are too confident of our oratory. So before they called your name, you jumped up. I have the answer. And then you come up and make a mess of yourself. Most of us believe in our track record. I've done this thing for 20 years. It is not a validation in the realm of the spirit. That you have done it for 30 years is not a validation. Every time you must depend on him. That's why the 20 and 4 elders, the Bible said day and night forever and ever they fell on their faces and what do they say holy 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 is the lord they hardly sit on their thrones they hardly put on their crown because they know what gives you ranking in zion is a disposition of humility so it is better to lie on the floor because the day you want to sit you may go down that's why lucifer said i will exalt my throne he didn't know the secret of ascension the secret of ascension is to lie on the floor. When you want to exalt your throne, pride has come into your heart and you will be cast from the mountain of God as profane for eternity. Elohim Madonai. Elohim Madonai. Elohim Adonai I heard Papa Ia Topoye He said God told him draw something on the floor When he drew it, he said clean it He cleaned it, he said the day you become proud That's how we erase you This is a man who sits down on a chair And nine million people gather There is a grace that commands crowd it's called anakazo. It is a grace. It's not about how well you can preach. You may have all the revelation, but you are proud. And you will preach all the revelation, write the best of books. Nobody will read it. Because what gives men visibility in the realm of the spirit will shield you. Because when God wants to give men, he give, give unto men. He say, I the Lord, I test the heart. I try the reins to give unto every man as his way should go. So he said, it is a disposition of humility that attracts the grace that makes the difference in your heart and in your life. And I said the third thing about grace is to engage grace. So in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1, he said, be strong in the grace that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. Many have grace, but they are not strong in grace. Because grace is not their first point of reference. They have too many advantages. When there is a challenge, before you come, they call the governor's brother. While you are here talking, they say, don't worry, don't worry. What's the problem? Okay, wait, I, I will call the governor now. I want to call the governor. Oh, do I call the governor or the senator? Oh, no. Let, let me call. Then suddenly there is COVID. And when there is COVID, they have the governor's number, they have the senator's number, but they say you can't travel out of Nigeria. And then for the first time, they become helpless. And they find themselves dying without help. The governor's phone number is still there. The senator's phone number is still there. But nothing can take you out of the borders. And then you hear that many billionaires died. I'm not saying this to, in a way of in, in, to inspire them or whatsoever. But I'm just telling you how that you should not anchor your confidence in mundane things. They will fail. He said, woe unto the man that put his trust in the arm of flesh. So to be strong in grace is to be totally dependent on God. I know the connections are beautiful, but before you subscribe to it, find out what God is saying. Find out. Don't be too quick to introduce yourself as a consultant judge. 
Don't be too quick to call yourself a son. Before you call yourself a son, bear it in your heart that you are a servant of God. You may have all the connection in the world, but you are first of all a servant of God. That's how to be strong in grace. When you find such a man, nothing can defeat him. Nothing. This is what God showed us in the morning. And tonight, I want to touch the second layer. Elohim Adonai Elohim Adonai The second significant pillar in that scripture is to also grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It happens to be that it will be impossible for you to grow in grace and not grow in the knowledge of Jesus. The two works hand in hand. So one of the ways of actually growing in grace is growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You cannot grow in grace and not know Jesus the Lord more and more. So it's said to be to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now the reason knowledge is so important is not just because you become vast. That kind of knowledge will puff you up. It will lead you in a part of a departure from God. So when we speak knowledge in this context, we are not talking about vastness. We are not talking about enrichment of your, your vocabulary, both in the natural or in the spirit. We are talking about experiencing God more. Having measures of God much more in your spirit man. Knowledge in spiritual context is actually experience. Many, a simple illustration. My wife works and she has colleagues that knew her four years ago, five years ago. I knew her maybe like two and a half years ago. But you see, I know her more than all her colleagues because her colleagues know about her. Me, I know her experientially. So the knowledge of God we are talking about here is not to know about God by the stories you heard or by reading a book. We are talking about experience, intercourse, intimacy with God. So he said to grow in grace, that kind of knowledge must also be increasing in your life. You must constantly grow in the experience of God. The reason our world is the way it is today is because many people bear the emblem of God who do not know God. They carry titles, they work in different offices as acclaimed, but the knowledge of God that supports their claim is not there. So many apostles have no understanding of spiritual things and they have no knowledge of God. They have read about God, they have the disposition, the structure, the lingo, but they don't know God. So most times, when they show up, God doesn't show up. They say many bogus things about God that never materialize because the knowledge of God is not there to substantiate their claims. Many Christians today, all they have are Christian names, but they don't have the experience of God. This is why our world is struggling because the people that should represent God are talking about a God they do not know. So Paul said, one of the ways to grow in grace is to grow in the knowledge, the experience of God. So that when you grow in the knowledge of God, you become a true witness of the God that you speak about. This is why when God created the man, the man was the representative of the God in the visible realm. The intention of God was never to show up in the visible realm. God had no plan of showing up in the visible realm. And that's why when the first man fell, it was another man God sent. Because God had no intention of manifesting in the visible realm. When the first Adam failed, God sent another Adam. Because in this realm, only men have the license to manifest 
and to represent God. This is why when Jesus sent men out, he didn't send them as preachers. He didn't send them as apostles and prophets. He didn't send them as believers. He sent them as witnesses. These are proof producers of the existence of an invincible God. They can manifest that God by singing, by preaching, by signs and by wonders. But by all means, this God must be manifested. Why is this so? Number one, because without knowledge, there can be no exploit. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 32, he said, They that don't know their God. Not they that call upon the name of their God. Not they that bear the name of their God. Not they that claim they know their God. He said, they.
flames of fire. But without the knowledge of God, we will never get there. We will keep coming to church. One man will stand and prophesy to 30 people. We will keep coming to church. One man will stand and pray for 30 sick people. What is going on? There is a lack of the knowledge of God. Why we celebrate those God is using mightily. We must come back to build the church of Christ. So that everybody will grow in the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ. That is the testimony. That everybody can look like Christ. Because everybody has come into the knowledge of the divine. But there is a protocol for knowledge. The knowledge of God is not in a story. It's not in a book. It begins with an encounter. It's a disclosure of divine realities to men. It's an encounter. In Matthew chapter 11 verse 25, he said, I thank you, Father, that you have revealed these things. You have hid these things from the wise and to the prudent. So it's not about your scholarly capacity. You can be wise. You can be prudent. You can have a master's degree in theology. You can be a PhD holder in pneumatology, but you will not know the Holy Ghost. Because you have hid these things from the wise and the prudent. And you have revealed them to babes. And you have revealed them to babes. He said, no one knows the son except the father. And no one knows the father except the son. And to him whom the son chooses to reveal him. So the way God is known is by an encounter. An encounter with the Lord. An encounter with the word. An encounter with the spirit. An encounter with the carrier of God. But by all means there must be a disclosure. If that disclosure doesn't happen. You will only know about God. You will never know God. He said the Lord appeared to Abraham. Acts chapter 7 verse 2. Genesis chapter 12 from verse 1 to 3. And said unto him. Get thee out of thy country. Get thee out of thy kindred. Get thee out of thy father's house. And I will show you the land that you will go to. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 1, it says Moses kept the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, until he came to Horeb, the mountain of God, and the Lord appeared to him. And he saw a bush burning that was not consumed. Moses had read about the oracles of God. Jethro is one of the Midianites, the sons of Keturah. He was the one that taught Moses priesthood. But Moses couldn't know God. Moses couldn't know God until an encounter came. He said, in those days, the voice of God was cast. 1 Samuel chapter 3 from verse 1 to 3. The voice of God was cast. There were no open visions. No open vision. The lamp in the temple had gone out. Everybody had become dark as touching the knowledge of God. But in verse 21, he said, the Lord appeared again unto Samuel in Shiloh. The Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Men know God by encounters. Before I tell you how to provoke an encounter, because that's where I'm going tonight. I need to let you know why encounters are very important. Number one, it imparts to you the experiential knowledge of God. Number two, it reveals to you the futility of life. A man who doesn't have an encounter will still boast in the flesh. And he will never grow in grace. He will never grow. God will constantly resist him. He will come to tell you how many times he has read the Bible cover to cover. Is it good to read the Bible cover to cover? Yes. But you don't know God because you read it cover to cover. I know theologians that if you quote three words in scriptures, they will tell you where it is. They are like concordances. They don't know God. When God reveals himself to you by an encounter, you will know that anything that does not accept, receive the approval of God is futility. In Ecclesiastic 1.14, it says, All is vanity and vexation of spirit. Vanity upon vanity. This is why God does these things by encounters. Because encounters will let you know that the race is not to the swift. Neither is the battle to the strong. It's of God that showeth mercy. When a man knows God by encounter, the more he knows God, the more humble he becomes. A man who truly has encountered God, one of the signatures you will see on his life is brokenness brokenness because what he sees he knows it's not if it's not for mercy he will never get there i was praying some years ago and we were already bragging how that we could pray in tongues for seven hours ten hours <laughs> don't blame us we are young people <laughs> we pray now for seven hours and one day i was praying I was so tired. I couldn't pray. I was so tired. And the moment I knelt down, 
I saw light came out of the wall and the light entered into me. It looked to me like five minutes. When I checked my time, I had prayed for six hours, 15 minutes. I now realize that wait, these things we are doing by our will, there is a grace dimension to it. So when I go to pray now, I say, quicken me, O Lord. Because he said, quicken us that we may call upon your name. And if I know that it is by a quickening of the spirit, I will never brag. That's why I stopped talking about how long I pray. Because I know that's not a factor in the realm of the spirit. Moses climbed the mountain. And when God descended upon Sinai, he was there for 40 days. He didn't know. So it was no longer about the time. It was about the things of the spirit. And the more you know the things of the spirit, the more the things of this world become futile. You will no longer make your boast in the natural. You will no longer make your boast in the flesh. If you must boast, you will boast in the Lord. I have walked up to this day because the Lord has helped me. That was the testimony of Paul. This was a man that before now we tell you he is stronger than all his brethren. He is vast. He is educated. He was trained by the best. He was Pharisee of Pharisee. But now he said, I have come this far because God has helped me. We are the circumcision. Philippians 3 verse 3 that worship God in the spirit rejoicing in Christ Jesus having no confidence in the flesh. He has seen the futility of life so there is nothing to boast about. That's why I said I count all things as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of the son of God. When you still find men bragging about the size of their congregation about the size of their cathedral about the size of their bank account about the cars they drive they have not seen the futility of life. They need an encounter. Only an encounter will let them know that all of these things count for nothing. The disciples came to Jesus and they were admiring the cathedral. And Jesus said, none of these stones shall be left untorn. He said, all of it will collapse. He said, but destroy this temple and I will build it in three days. He was talking about a heightened dimension. Another kind of temple that is not built by the hand of man. This one man brag about in the realm of the spirit is nothing. And I've seen buildings that were built 50 years ago. Now, I laugh. I wonder, some of these buildings, people were killed on account of it. Have you seen buildings 50 years ago? The houses those days that they called bungalows. The duplexes of those days. When you enter the parlor now, you are wondering, where did they keep the chair? The whole building is like, it's like the kitchen that people use now. But 50 years ago, that was where the world we entered. What we call super, 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 what superfluous excellence of architecture today. In the next seven years, 70 years, when our children come, they'll be like, hi, these architectures now, wow. What did they read? Because you will come and the building will be glass. You will use the remote and fold the building. When you come, you click the remote and the building arranges itself. And then you are wanting. <laughs> Meanwhile, the one we are building now, we want to kill ourselves. No. It's the futility of life. He said, all oh, is vanity. So instead of building and putting your confidence in mundane things, we press for the mark of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. Yesterday, I came to a point where hunger overwhelmed me. Now I want to come to another point. Lord, show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. A man that brought down the civilization of Egypt with a staff was not bragging. A man that could tell the earth, open your mouth and swallow them up. That man does not brag in all of the exploit. Show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. I know I have built a 50,000 auditorium, but show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. I know I have traveled around the world, but show me thy glory. I know I can call five presidents now, but show me thy glory. Do I need all of these things? Yes. Because the kingdom through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. But why the kingdom is being spread? Lord, show me thy glory. I know these things don't count. I won't journey into eternity with them. The one I carry in my spirit is what I will travel into the realms of Zion. So as beautiful as all of these things are, I forget the former things. I forget the former things. The one thing I do is to press for the things that is before me. I keep at it. I keep at it. Only an encounter can school you that much. If you find some of these mighty men that have done mighty things for God, 
you will discover that those things don't move them. They have passed those things. It is God that drives them. I was in a conference where Dr. Paul was speaking. This is a man who had built 100,000 capacity seater auditorium. And he was talking that day, he was asking the wife, when was the last time he ate? And the wife said, like 14 days ago. I said, well, 14 hours, or what are you saying? When was the last time he ate? 14 days ago. And when he came for the meeting, he was weeping from beginning to the end. I was trying to cry, I couldn't cry. And now, started looking for a song that will break my heart. I was trying, I couldn't cry. And I said, Lord, I have not achieved anything yet. My heart is this strong like a stone. <laughs> Where can we get to? We are still pursuing power. We are pursuing anointing. We are pursuing gift of the spirit. So when we come for a meeting, we'll stand like this and say, touch. They are vanity. Everybody Jesus raised from the dead died again. Everybody that was sick still died. Everybody healed still died. But there is something that remains with you. It is the measure of God that you capture in your spirit. Informing the way you live your life and everything you do. That one will journey with you through the veil of eternity. And when you stand before God, it will be an eternal memorial. This is why the knowledge of God is important. River flow, river flow. Let the tunnel river flow in your church once again. Let it turn into river flow, river flow. Let the tunnel river flow in your church once again. So the first purpose of encounter is to educate you about God, to teach you God experientially. Number two is to reveal to you the vanity of life. And number three is to reveal to you your purpose and your calling. Without an encounter, you will do many things that appeal to you. Only an encounter will isolate your purpose and your calling. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, he said, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I sanctified you and I ordained you to be a prophet. Your purpose is the reason for your creation. Your calling is the strategy for fulfilling that purpose. It's only an encounter that can give you those details of your life. And that's what will make your destiny count. Myself and another brother can be both called to reveal Jesus to a generation by healing their bodies. That's our purpose. To reveal Christ through healing people's bodies. But our callings will be different. He may be healing people's body through medical science. I may be healing people's body through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If we don't know by encounter, both of us may know our purpose that we came to address the affliction of men as touching their body. But I may go the way of a doctor, he may go the way of a preacher. And you will juxtapose destiny. And you will find yourself struggling in the flesh but when an encounter comes it does not only reveal to you your purpose it also reveals to you your calling so there is precision in your life and the moment there is precision in your life precision begets productivity so when paul said grow in the grace of god and in the knowledge of god he was talking about the experience of god he was talking about life eternal. He was talking about exploits in the kingdom. Because if you don't grow in the knowledge of God, you will never apprehend the life of God. The reason people are sick today is because of what they know. Not because of sickness. There is a knowledge of God you step into that you will begin to walk in divine health. There is a knowledge of God you step into that you begin to walk in rest on every side. Everything you touch begins to prosper because exploit it's a function of knowledge. So when he said grow in the knowledge of God, he wasn't talking about reading a book about God. He was actually talking about changing the quality of your life through intercourse and intimacy. He was talking about making impact and exploit in your life by that same knowledge. He was talking about realizing the essence of your existence, your purpose and your calling. 
and he was talking about realizing the futility of life so that you can make the right choices all the time how do you provoke encounters if the knowledge of God is predicated upon encounters then it's important for you to understand how to provoke encounters there are men that have mastered these things you know when you begin to walk in in a particular kind of grace you will discover that you will keep enjoying promotions you may have a gift of healing and then you come for a meeting when you sense that god wants to heal the sick you pray they'll be healed but a point will come when you will grow it from a gift to a ministry when it becomes a ministry you don't need to wait until god moves you you know how to stare what you carry so you can tell people on tuesday is healing service the holy ghost didn't tell you but now you are no longer functioning at the level of a gift you have made it a ministry so you know what to do to make that dimension manifest and if they come on tuesday god will heal the sick you may have a gift or word of knowledge it's a gift a point come when it becomes a ministry a prophetic ministry when it becomes a prophetic ministry you can organize a prophetic service for people for people you can organize a prophetic service for nations and you will come on a day of your choice at a time of your choice and manifest that gift it's no longer a gift it's now a ministry so when we grow in god there are promotions a point come when you migrate from the realm of a servant the lowest level of working with god in this kingdom is to be a servant a servant has no inheritance a servant lives at the mercy of his master and he also lives on the strength of the quality of his service so if a servant doesn't work he may not enjoy the mercy of his master and he may have nothing in that place he has no rights he has no stakes but when you journey with god you will promote you'll be promoted by knowledge you know the bible said in galatians 4 1 the heir so long as he's a child is not different from a servant he is supposed to walk in inheritance but because of his ignorance he will be living like a servant the way you see christians today begging for money begging for bread he said he giveth bread to the eater and seed to the sower yet there are christians begging for bread for bread that's the realm of a servant there are many people today who are begging for healing when they should command demons of healing and address sicknesses it's a realm of servants but when you grow in knowledge you journey from the realm of a servant you come to the realm of a friend they say you are no longer servant you have become friends and if you are friends you know the secrets of the kingdom so as a friend you are entitled to privileges you still don't have rights but you have privileges so god can give you things when you make demand but as you grow in knowledge you you leave the level of a privilege so god doesn't show you things because you ask for you can now command and demand things when you enter that realm you have entered the realm of a son a son doesn't live on the strength of privileges a son lives on the strength of rights because these are his inheritances in romans 8 17 he say you are heirs of god and joint heirs with christ so what christ have is yours that's why peter said in first peter is it acts 3 20 now he said all things are yours all things are your so you don't receive things by privilege anymore you receive things by right when you need money you say father in the name of the lord jesus every gate of favor is open i decree that all my helpers are coming and all that i need is provided in the name of jesus you take your bath you are going out your wife say come what oh, about the house rent we are talking about you say the house rent have been handled how where is it it has been handled don't worry two days to the house rent. how about the house rent? it has been handled the day to pay when the landlord comes you transfer the money to him it can happen a second before that time but you know because you have decreed that it should be done and it must be done you are functioning in the realm of a son it is knowledge that brings you there this is why encounters are too important so that we stop living in the realm of beggars we start living in the realm of sons you see i've seen an abomination upon the face of the earth that sons princes are trekking while beggars are riding on horses when you see such things happen it is a testimony of the depravity of the knowledge of god amongst his people in hosea chapter 4 verse 6b he said my people perish for the lack of knowledge so when you see people go through crisis don't be quick to pray for them find out what they know because if you pray for them they will go back to that situation he said when an evil spirit is gone out of a man he moves about in dry places if he doesn't find where to stay it will return the house will be kept garnished and empty 
He said, worse will be the state of that man than the beginning thereof. So you have not really been helped when you are given what you need. You have been helped when you have been taught how to generate what you need. The knowledge of God is a function of encounters. And encounters are a product of a definite protocol. The first protocol of encounter is the protocol of separation. You don't know God in a crowd. You don't know God on transit. You don't know God in the public. For you to know God, your hunger must separate you. Your desire must be strong enough until you put certain things on hold and go to seek after him. That's why before Abraham knew him, he said, get thee out of thy country. Get thee out of thy kindred. Get thee out of thy father's house. Before Moses knew him, he said he came to Horeb, the backside of the desert. Even to Horeb, the mountain of God. Many are on a speed lane and they are assuming that while they are yet busy, the knowledge of God will come to them. They will work for 30 years. At the end of the day, they will only brag with how long they've done what they've done. But when you look at them, you will know they have not grown. Because you are doing what you are doing for 30 years, yet you are not making impact. It means there is a knowledge gap. So the power is not in how long you have done it. How efficacious are you doing it? How effective are you with what you are doing? It takes knowledge. Sometimes you have to step aside and find out why is the word of the Lord not coming to pass? Why is this thing not growing? Why am I not seeing the change that was prophesied? Why am I not seeing the things I saw in vision? It is in separation that knowledge is imparted. Many are too busy to acquire the knowledge of God. As beautiful as this conference is, this conference will only kickstart hunger in your spirit. You must go and see God for yourself. Find out every man that made impact by God. There were times of separation. Many times when they buried themselves in God's presence. Because he's a king spirit. If you don't give him attention, he will not have your time. Too many are not separated. You call yourself a prophet. You are running up and down every day. And you think the dimension of the prophet will hit you on your journey. You are joking. Even Paul, Jesus met him on the way. And Jesus told him, go into the city. You'll be told what to do. And after he went to the city, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17, he said, when he pleased the father to reveal the son in me, I confessed not with flesh and blood. I went into Arabia. I went into Arabia. He had to separate himself until Christ brought illumination to his spirit. Why do you think many people say bogus things that they've seen, yet there is no result? It's because they didn't take time to separate themselves. So they don't know the strategy. When I started, all I had was utterance. But as I separate myself unto the Lord once and again, sometimes I come for a service and it's like a flash. And I just see something. And I can tell you where I saw it in the service. And if I point it 1,000 times, it will happen. If I tell you how I get to know it, I don't know. Once upon a time, when I was separated, I saw an eagle bigger than a building. And the eagle will just flap its wing. And it will move from one state to another. And while I was looking, I saw myself hung on the wing of the eagle. And when I woke up, suddenly the doors opened to me. Every day I am in one state or another. It looks like people are scavenging and fighting for me to come to the state. Even when I'm tired, they say, come like that. We just want to see you. Some conferences I come, I can't even preach. I say, see, I beg, I beg. Make I take one session. One, one session. Meanwhile, people are scavenging to be on every conference. It's not about politics. It's not about politics. What have you seen? What have you heard? When you are separated, you will see things that will distinguish you from men. Why other men are trying to manipulate in the flesh? You just be separated. When you are separated, dimensions will be clothed upon you. The Bible said Elijah was separated. And in 1 Kings 18, from verse 45, you see, and the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. He outran the chariots of Ahab, even unto Jezreel. Nobody is disadvantaged by separation. Sometimes, step out of the church. Allow the assistant pastor to preach. Go and lock yourself up. Because there are many details about the promotion and the progress of the work of God in that church that you will never see if you are busy, week in, week out. 
Sometimes you have to step out of your business for one day and go to the mountain and say, Lord, I love you. I just came here to be with you. Thank you for all you've done for me. You know I didn't deserve any of these things. You just showered me with mercy. How would I have built all of these things? Father, I love you. I came here to spend time with you because you are the source of my life. You are the hope of my life. You are everything I am. And while you are separated, God showed up, shows up. And say, last year you made four million. This year you will make four billion. The business will not change, but the verdict of the king has gone forth. And you will be doing the same thing you are doing, but your results will be different. The same Sunday service you are holding every Sunday. And you cook your messages and come to preach. And people encourage you that they were blessed. Suddenly you separate yourself. And when you come for the service, the moment you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, demons begin to scream. What happened? What happened? You separated yourself. He said the spirit drove him into the wilderness. Matthew 4 verse 1. And when he returned, Matthew 4 15, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zabulon. The land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentile, the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. Separation provoked illumination. He was always light, but the territory never recognized it until he was separated. I know you are a preacher. I know you are a businessman. I know you are a worshiper. But how much investment of separation have you put into that music? Have you put into that preaching? Have you put into that word? If there is no separation, the grasses will never be green. But when you are separated, you dig new wells. That well you are drawing from, too many people have drank from it. They are no longer interested in it. A point was came when you showed up to preach and people are tired. They have drank that water for too long. They want to test of a new water. You have to separate and dig another well. That's why Isaac kept digging until he came to Rehoboth. Separation. Many don't know God because they never separate. You think by hearing the story of Bethany the Hosea, you will know God? You think by hearing the story of Maron Branham, by hearing the story of A.A. Allen, it will only inspire your faith. My brother, you must hear and you must see. You must hear and you must see. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. That was when the messianic dimension of prophecy came to him. You must hear and you must see. Thank God for the exploit of the fathers. It inspires our faith. But for us to step into our own dimension, we must know God for ourselves. Gideon heard all the story, but he was stretching floor in the wine press. He was still afraid. The Midianites were still dominating them until on the valley of encounter, he said, go in this thy might. Stories alone are not enough. They will inspire your faith, but you must pay the price of separation. If you don't pay the price of separation, you will never know God. You will end up becoming an echo saying the things you heard other men say and the people who have not heard it before will be inspired and they will clap hand but after a while you will run out of stories too many don't know god yet with titles with churches with businesses and claiming that they are witnesses you like a mighty wind spirit of victory Cover us with your wings. Blow, 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 blow like a mighty wind. Please sit. Spirit of victory. Cover us with your wings. When you are separated, then the second protocol is activated. It's called waiting on the Lord. I'm showing you how you get to know God experientially through encounters. It can be walked deliberately. When you grow in the things of the spirit, you know how to walk it. The sign that you have grown is that things don't happen to you. You make things happen. You can engender dimensions and possibilities deliberately. And if the church learns these things and give themselves wholly to it, you will see what will happen to people. The change will be so radical. You will wonder. Because even men who are never educated, we host dimensions and possibilities that you will know this is the finger of God. Separation is detachment 
from the distractions of this life. But waiting upon the Lord is focusing your affections on God. A man could be detached, but his affection could wander around. So in Colossians chapter 3 for verse 1, it says, If you are dead in Christ, let your affection be on the things above where Christ is. That's waiting upon the Lord. When you come into a restaurant and a waiter is standing, the waiter is not just standing there. All his attention is on you. He will come to you. Do you need anything, sir? And he said, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll call you shortly. Thank you, sir. He will go and stand and all his or her attention is on you. If you do like this, the waiter will see you. He will see you. Any sign you give, the waiter will pick it. Why? Because the attention of the waiter was on you. He wa the waiter was not just separated, standing in the bar. No, that's not the goal. The goal is not separation. The goal is to focus on God. So when you are separated, you now begin to consciously wait on the Lord. Sometimes it becomes difficult to gather your attention. So you pray in the Holy Ghost for some hours. Your mind is wandering up and down. <laughs> Why can't I? You are not praying to beat four hours. You are bringing your mind under subjection. You are bringing your mind under government. So if it means praying in tongues for seven hours to gather your spirit, that's when the journey begins. Many babes go to prayer. And because they have prayed for five hours, they run out and tell everybody, we prayed for five hours. So what happened? The goal is not the time. The goal is the appearing of the king. That's why Moses will climb Horeb and still wait for six days until the glory of God comes down. And Moses will say, if you don't go with us, we will not live here. The goal is not the time. It is the, the appearing of